Welcome. My name is Mike Pickett. I'm Director of Community Relations here at Purdue, and in that role, I want to say welcome to all these great folks wearing the Vegas gold lily shirts. Uh, how appropriate is that? And then uh, to all the students who are here, welcome back. It's going to be a great year at Purdue, and in fact, it'll be a great year that classes started last week, and wait till, wait till tomorrow night. You're going to love it. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, this is a, a pretty special and unique kind of program, and, and I am really honored to be a part of it. Um, we're going to hear from uh, two people in, in really key leadership roles, and uh, perhaps we're gonna, you're going to learn a little bit about uh, how they compare and contrast in, in uh, what happens in, in, in their lives every day. Uh, and I think what's going to happen is you're going to find more things that are comparable uh, between a business CEO and, and uh, a Big Ten basketball coach probably than, than you're going to find out in differences. But uh, I'll let them tell their stories, and you can make that decision when we're finished. Dave Ricks is the chief executive of Eli Lilly uh, since January of 2017, as chairman of the board since June of last year. A 20-year Lilly veteran, he served as president of Lilly Biomedicines from 2012 to 2016, and prior to that was president of Lilly USA, the company's largest affiliate from 2009 to 2012. He served as president and general manager of Lilly China, operating one of the world's fastest growing emerging markets from 2008 and 2009, and GM of Lilly Canada in 2005 to 2008, after roles of director of pharmaceutical marketing and national sales director in that company. He actually joined Lilly in 1996 as a business development associate. So see, you can move up, you young people, getting ready to go there. Um, he earned a bachelor's degree from Purdue University in 1990. And he also has an MBA from in 1996. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the chief executive officer of Eli Lilly and Company, Dave Ricks. Thank you. I've been introducing this other guy uh, ever since he came to Purdue. He's in his 14th season now as head coach, and, and uh, uh, I usually introduce him as one of the uh, great young minds in college basketball. I think after 14 years, I can just say, Coach, he has one of the great minds in college basketball. <laughs> we appreciate all he's done. In fact, he uh, brought back-to-back -back Sweet 16s to Purdue in 2017 and 2018. He's returned the Boilermakers to the Big Ten's hierarchy, and I'll tell you what, he has this program positioned to be near the top again. This is going to be another fun season. He's entering his 2018-19 season as the all-time, third all-time winningest coach in Purdue history behind Gene Cady and Piggy Lambert. Both are in the uh, College Basketball Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, the head coach of the Boilermakers, Matt Painter. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, I want to introduce you to uh, two people who have uh, Purdue backgrounds and also uh, are involved with Lilly now, two Purdue basketball alumna. Uh, Rafael Davis and Tori Thornton are with us today. <laughs> both great basketball players here at Mackey Arena and now both involved with Eli Lilly and company. So welcome back to campus. All right, let's get started. I want to, uh, perhaps if we can, have, have Dave, if you will, tell us a, uh, the, the Lilly story, a little bit about the history. I'm sure not everybody knows the, uh, uh, the, what's gone on, but it's, the, you've been around here and a significant part of, of uh, not just Indiana, but in, uh, of the world, and particularly the healthcare world, for 140 years. Tell us about that history. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Great to be here with you, and great to be here with you, Coach. Um, yeah, like Purdue, we're an old insti Indiana institution. I think Purdue's 150 this year, is that right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday, Purdue. Right. Um, we are uh, 141 years old, um, so nine years after Purdue was founded, um, and founded by a Civil War colonel who uh, wanted to make quality medicines, uh, having seen the atrocities of medical care in a war zone like the Civil War. Um, he was a pharmacist, not a Purdue pharmacist, but a pharmacist. Uh, although his first business was in Lafayette, uh, which failed. In fact, I think he had eight failed businesses before he started Lilly, which obviously went on to succeed. And that's a lesson, I think, in life. There's more failure than success, but you learn from each one and progress. And then it was a family-run company for about 100 years. 
So his son, then his two grandsons ran the company for 100 years, which is a remarkable thing, because usually the third generation screws things up. <laughs> <laughs> but the two, the two Did you hear that, Grandpa? Yeah, <laughs> the, two, the two grandsons were, were incredible people. We can talk about that if you want. Um, and then in the 60s, we went public. And really, under the, the final CEO, the, who also was named Eli Lilly, um, we globalized the company. Uh, he took us internationally to China, to, to Europe, and really brought the company in the modern age. And then we went public, and since then, have been doing what we do, which is primarily making medicines for sick people. Um, I think the company's uh, most famous for our role in diabetes treatment. So we were the company that first commercialized uh, insulin for diabetics, which formerly was a, a death sentence. Um, people would survive something like 12 to 18 months. Uh, the treatment was starvation. Uh, and then uh, we commercialized insulin in the 20s, and that really made the modern company, both scientifically and commercially. And since then, we've been building our diabetes presence. We're also famous for Prozac, which has uh, obviously changed depression and neuroscience care and saved the lives in other ways of, of millions. Uh, we're famous for Cialis, which is uh, seen on TV all the time. Uh, and most recently, we've been really in a, a great uh, run of growth. Um, the company's um, one of the fastest growing companies in our sector. We've launched um, 10 medicines in the last three or four years, and that's what it's all about, bringing new medicines to patients. So we're in an exciting time, and it's a huge honor to lead a company that's got that kind of legacy and history, and um, I feel lucky. You're a Craner alum. Tell us about your Purdue experience and, and what that's done to uh, help you along to where you are today. What are your lessons that you learned here? Well, there's many. Um, some probably I shouldn't repeat uh, in, this, in this audience. Uh, I always enjoyed going to watch Matt play basketball and uh, going to Mackey. That was, that's a big part of being on a Big Ten campus is campus life. But, you know, I think, I think Purdue's a tough school. Uh, we hire a lot of people from here because of that, actually. Uh, by the way, so is life, right? And, and it's good preparation to have to do hard things. Um, competitive academic programs, rigorous technical skills, this is what we need uh, to drive a business in the 21st century based on science, which is our business. Um, I think Purdue also, it's a Midwestern school, and people here who are, um, get out ahead of themselves and talk a big game but don't back it up, don't do very well. Um, and that's true at Lilly as well. I think it's a humble place um, where we, we really rely on teamwork and collegiality uh, to get the work done. So. Those are things I learned here. Well, think and, uh, think about now 2018 and the role of the university as compared to when you were here. Is it, and how does, yeah. how does that impact Lilly? Well, I, kids are better trained now. I mean, I, I was, I've got a senior in high school, I'm, and uh, I'm not sure I would get into many colleges <laughs> now. <laughs> she's got great grades and high test scores, and she's all stressed out. Um, but uh, I think the academic programs have developed and improved. Um, dramatically, and that helps us as an employer. On the other hand, I think what probably has um, slowed down in the 22-year-old coming off campus is their ability to uh, be independent and sort of um, function um, as adults in the, in, in independently in the world and make choices and re lead others. There's not as many maybe opportunities, I perceive that. Um, and so we're getting a little more specialized in what we do. Um, and I'd encourage students to take advantage of leadership opportunities on campus, to get involved in activities that broaden their transferable skills, because that's what makes, uh, of course, you have to know your stuff, but in the business world, it, it takes a fair amount of those things as well. Can I, can I persuade others? Can I lead others? Those are the, we, we need both. And, and I think that's a key opportunity to take advantage on a big school, big campus like Purdue. You've now introduced this concept called Team Lilly. Uh, and it, it sounds great, and that's probably the reason that we're here with the coach. But tell us about Team Lilly and, and what you're accomplishing. Yeah, so the companies um, about 10 years ago went through some difficult times, and I think our strategy to organize through that time was kind of to divide and conquer. Everyone put your head down and do your job. Um, and I think we're pretty successful with that. But now as we try to go from good to great, um, I think we need another gear, and that's going to come through teamwork. Um, and I'm interested in the coach's views on this, but uh, we know it's possible to take um, a bunch of very good people and have something excellent if you perform well together. It's also possible to have a bunch of all-stars and perform horribly. Um, 
and we're after that special sauce to, um, as a big company, we're, you think of Lilly as a big company in Indiana, but we're the 13th biggest drug company in the world. We're not gonna win on size. We need to be faster, smarter, better together. And that's gonna come through teamwork. So that's the, the essence of the concept. So if people are interested in working in a company that embraces that spirit, that's, we're a good choice. Uh, that's what we're trying to shape. Sounds to me like Purdue basketball. <laughs> I don't know that you've ever recruited a five star maybe, but uh, you certainly made some great, well, you got one sitting right here in front of you that, uh, that, that really epitomized team. Tell us what that, what, what he's trying to do, how that relates to what you're doing at, at, in Mackey. Um, well, I think, first of all, you know, your product is your people. Um, so when you look at a basketball team, a lot of times people don't understand. Um, each guy has people around him in basketball. Everybody thinks they, can, they understand the game of basketball. When in reality, like, could you hit a baseball if it was pitched 90 miles per hour? You cannot. Okay? If you go on a football field, like, you really don't want to go on a pass pattern or take somebody down on a wrestling mat. But if you walk through a basketball court, everybody says, hey, give me a shot. Let me, let me, give me that ball. Let me, let me shoot that. So more people understand the game of basketball. They, they just do. So wrapping their heads around it. With that being said, when you go home, more people have an opinion. So when you coach a guy, you coach a guy, but yet they listen to a lot of people. So the one thing that I always try to do is just build a relationship of trust. Um, with that player, build a relationship with the player. Don't worry about everything else. There's too many things to worry about. If a kid's listening to an agent, if he's listening to his parents about basketball. So just locking in and then recruiting the right person. Um, the one thing you want, I know this is profound, but you want a good player, you want a good student, and you want a good person. You know, that, 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 that combination um, and, that, and that quality right there. Um, but you also have to understand what it, what it, what it comes with. Um, and now you have a team. So it's different. It's a, it's a lot different. Like he's talking about piecing things together and we want all-stars, but we also want role players. And you, ha you, you can't have all role players. You just can't. You have to have some people, but you also can be an all-star in your role. And so like sometimes you want to be the lead in the play, um, but the guy running those lights is pretty important. And the person doing the wardrobe is pretty important. And so when you think along those lines, whatever, and field in a team, you make a lot of mistakes. When you're in charge, you make a lot of mistakes. And uh, you just learn from those mistakes and you try to, I always say, try to find another one. Try to mess up some other way. And then eventually, hopefully, you just run out of finding ways how to mess up. <laughs> and I know that, that uh, is kind of funny and ironic, but it's, it's true. Um, and, uh, but I, sometimes it's hard to describe. You just know it when you see it. And um, we're not here because this guy's talented or that guy's talented. We're here for production. They're there for production. If they don't produce at the end of the day, but make sure you evaluate and you recruit production too. Mm. And I always say you can't have enough human beings. I love human beings. And uh, when you get those people that, that are acting crazy or you get the people that are acting on their own, because we're in a team sport, you know, that's not gonna lead to production. You know, we want people that are going to be a good teammate. We want to be people that are going to sacrifice. Um, and that's hard to do when you're 17, 18 years old because every single person I recruit, he, he's recruiting a grown-up. Um, I'm not recruiting grown-ups. I'm recruiting kids. And so, but yet that I got to get them to understand how this is going to work for them. All right. How do you do that? Huh? For me, I think you got to lose people as much as you got to get people. You got to lose people on your own terms. Mm -hmm. So I like to be straightforward. I like to be transparent. I like to be honest. Um, I don't promise you you're going to start. I don't promise you you're going to play. Um, and part of that, you know, sometimes my assistants kick me under the kitchen table while I'm saying it. Um, but I just feel that that helps our chemistry. Um, it helps our togetherness. But you're going to lose some guys that way. But the guys that you do get, you're going to get on your terms. And so when things happen at Purdue, um, you know, they, they knew it was coming. You know, that's what he told me. He was honest with me. He was trust. We've all played for some, if you've ever played competitive sports, we've all played for somebody that we felt like wasn't straightforward um, with us. And uh, I just don't want to be that guy. And so if we, you know, I always say that, you know, we're going to work hard. We're going to do everything in our power to win, but we're not going to lose our soul in the process. Um, we're going to do things a certain way. And we are, this is the business of education. You know, even though I'm a basketball coach, I'm an educator. Um, how he is as a player really deep down. It's, it's fun, it's entertaining, 
but he's going to be a former player the rest of his life. He was a college basketball player for four years. He's going to be a former player for 50 years. You know, he's going to have his own family and raise them and raise them under what values. So we always try to, coaches try to change. Coaches struggle changing people, even though we can do it a little bit. We can't do it a lot. So it's better to go out and recruit and get the right people that were raised with the right family values. But it's also a challenge sometimes when somebody doesn't have that, when someone grows up, um, you know, without a dad. You know, somebody grows up and um, they don't understand some of the things that somebody grows up and, and has that kind of support and has those kind of resources. To me, that's challenging, but you also have to understand um, it is harder. It, it's definitely harder. You get them to a level. You, you, sweet 16, two years in a row. This year, you set a goal to go what, national champion, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. How do you take a team that's been to a level and get yeah. them excited to go that next one? Well, you don't go back and start at the Sweet 16. It starts over. It's a process. Um, you're not automatically in that tournament. Um, you got to earn your way in that tournament. So you, you start over again. And um, I think that's through improvement. It's through guys working on their game. But it's also guys understanding roles. I think that's one of the hard things to do is get guys to understand um, their roles. And sometimes as a coach, you don't know those roles. Sometimes they have to evolve on their own. So it's so important when you don't know to back up and say that. Um, so that's really where we start. Like right now, we're, you know, we're getting in shape. Last two summers, we went to Spain and we went to Taiwan. This summer, um, we didn't do an international trip. And uh, so it's a little bit different. Um, we lost four seniors. Um, but I really liked the guys that didn't play last year as much. I thought they were really good players. Um, we just had some guys that were in front of them. Um, so I'm excited about seeing those guys grow and uh, play more of a significant role. But I just try to keep it with the process. Just, you know, try to win the day. Um, don't worry. There's, there's so much that guys worry about. Don't, don't worry about that. Just keep your life simple. Keep your nose clean. Go to class. Be on time. Um, do the little things. So when I played college basketball, um, my college coach, Coach Katie, he had three rules. And, uh, you know, be on time, try your best, and act right. And if you just think about keeping it simple and doing those three things. Now, act right's a, a big umbrella. Um, so a very big umbrella. <laughs> um, but if you just, if you keep your life simple um, and, and just try your best and you have the ability, I'm not in the business of taking bad players. So if you got a Purdue jersey on, I, I think you're a good basketball player. Um, so that's a start. So I, I always fight these guys, and Rayfell's heard me speak a lot. So uh, you, you end up, you become very redundant to the people that hear you a lot. But um, you know, Purdue can't beat Purdue. They just can't. You know, don't beat yourself. But that's a lot of things that happen in life where you kind of lose that individual peace because you end up doing something foolish from a social standpoint. Um, you know, don't don't beat yourself. Don't put yourself in a bad position. Um, but from a basketball standpoint, that happens in a competitive sports. It happens a lot. People don't necessarily win games as much as the other team loses it. Um, you know, learn to really diminish um, those things. You know, take care of the basketball, take good shots. You know, don't turn the ball over, know your scouting report, just be consistent in, in what you do. We heard about, you're talking about how you bring in a group of guys together, and I want to have, I want to hear both of you and, and how you do that with Team Boilermaker and and Team Lilly, what do you, Matt? Start with you. What, what? How do you get these guys together, to, and uh, uh, you know, to get the guys who are all stars of their high school team right. to learn their position, learn their role, yeah. and be a team? Well, you do it a lot through the summer, through the spring, and through the fall. A lot of the things that you break down with, um, you learn a lot through film. You learn a lot through watching um, and understanding things. Some for some young guys come in more ready than others. Um, but you just teach, you know, you, you teach them your system, you teach them how you play, but you also have to understand what you have. Each system is a little bit different with your personnel as it changes. We've never been locked in to this is how we play and you're going to fit that no matter what. That, that isn't really our philosophy. Now I'll be that way defensively, um, but I won't be that way as much um, offensively. So, you, you know, in basketball you teach the part and you teach the whole. And so a lot of the part comes through the summer through working on your game, and then as you put the whole together, they have to understand how they can apply those things in a team concept. So you have to be able to show. Last year, we were the second most efficient offensive team in the country. Villanova was first. So we have good decision makers. 
Um, we had five people shoot 39% from three or above, um, which was the best in the country. We've had the, the third best three-point percentage in the last two years in college basketball. So as you see the pro game evolve, the more people that you can get to make threes, shoot 80% from the free throw line, and then obviously take care of the basketball. Don't turn the basketball over. Don't beat yourself. You see it more prevalent, um, obviously, in football because you get a pick six. You know, it's such a turn of events in a, in a game of football when someone gets an interception and runs it back because it's obviously for more points and it's a lower scoring game. Um, in basketball, it's the giveaway takeaway. You know, if I throw it to you and I take away the two points we could have got and then you got two points, it's a four point differential. And so you, you get a handful of those in a game, that's 20 points you're down. So you have to be able to understand, I need to recruit people that can do those, those things. Well, what we've been able to incorporate is a bunch of guys that can do those things, and then we try to teach them how to defend, we try to teach them team defense, and then we've had really, really good size. So we've had A.J. Hammonds at seven foot, Isaac Haas at seven two, Caleb Swanigan um, at 6'10". So we've had some of the better, bigger guy, big guys in our league and in the country. You put them with good decision makers, with good skilled guys, and now you're going to have a really efficient offense. Our sport's tied together offensively and defensively more than other sports. So if you can be a really good offensive team and you're not putting yourself in transition very much um, from a defensive standpoint, all right, you're always setting your defense. You want the other team to go against a set defense as much as possible. If they're going in transition and they're going on four on three breaks, three on two breaks, five on three breaks, they're at an advantage. You want them to go five on five versus set defense as much as you possibly can. Well, it starts with your decision making. And so now, the better you can be offensively, the better you're going to be defensively. It's not the backbone of a defensive principle, but it is a really good start. How do you do that at Lilly? Pull a team together. Well, I mean, I agree with the coach on recruiting. You know, the, the people around the table matter most. You've got to want to be a part of that environment and then um, have the uh, ability to work together. But so we're, we're, we've been looking at big organizations recently and looking for models, et cetera. And there's sort of four principles that um, we're trying to reinforce uh, at the leadership level of the company. And hopefully um, that trickles through. One is a, a common purpose. So in our business, it's not so simple as win the game. There's, there's huge complexity to what we do, and it's a very long game. So the, the medicine idea to market is, is about 12 years. Uh, so we have to be good for 12 straight years to get that to work. Um, but keeping the purpose in mind that we all connect to what we're trying to do is get a medicine to a patient um, helps. Because then that's an outside force, not an inside uh, competition of sorts that pulls people together. Another um, thing we're trying to work on, I think we have some improvement at Lilly, but uh, I, I like some of the recent things we've done, is making sure we all have the same idea of what we're dealing with, so sharing context. Um, it's a huge organization, 40,000 people. We operate in 140 countries. What's happening? Simple question, long answers. But if we want to have a fast-moving team approach, more people to know, need to know what's happening. It can't be Dave sitting there with all the information and people waiting for a speech. Um, everyone has to know what's happening all the time. So we need to share information as we share the goal. And then, you know, I think there's a trust element that's in any team. I'm interested in your, your, your perspectives yeah. on this, Coach. But there is, you can't manage it all through. At some stage, people just have to trust that this team's going to deliver when yeah. I deliver. And if that doesn't happen, why should I try, right? And, but if it happens every time, now I feel an obligation to try even harder because I know they're doing their piece. So that's, that's a big part of winning as well. How Those do you some build that culture, though? Every, every minute of every day. <laughs> you have to model it yourself. And I think that's one of the harder parts about leadership is there are no off minutes, no off days. Um, you have to be, so it can't just be surface. You have to, like, breathe this stuff yeah. because you can't fake it. Uh, yeah, what they, yeah, what they can have in a corporation like that is, um, for lack of a better term, they have corporate DNA. Whereas the college basketball turns over. Rayfield Davis is great, but he leaves. Yeah, four um, years. Yeah. You see the San Antonio Spurs, they had corporate DNA um, at the San Antonio Spurs, which is rare in the NBA with the free agent market, um, with the draft, with guaranteed versus non-guaranteed. Um, but they had Tim Duncan for 17 years. They had Mono Ginobili for 18 years. They had Tony Parker for 14, 15 years. So they're three key players probably 
uh, shared 12 to 13 of those years, they were the three best players. They had something different at the highest level. They had the corporate DNA. And so like what he is, is talking about, like, you know, you, you hire great people, you train great people, and you want to be able to keep those, those people. So I'm, my assistants that are really good, they're going to be able to get a head coaching job. They're going to move. And so now I'm going to have a, you know, another guy. I have one guy for eight years. I have one guy for five, and I have one guy for one. And I'm constantly trying to help them become a head coach. I don't, that doesn't necessarily help me yeah. um, by doing that, but it helps them. And somebody helped me in the process. And so that's what you kind of repay. But that's the one thing about a corporation that you kind of, as a coach, you kind of envy um, because it's hard. You know, Caleb Swanigan, just think of Caleb Swanigan was coming back for us next year. But think if I had to go against every single player at Ohio State, Indiana, and Michigan State that's left early. So think if Cody Zeller st stayed, Victor Aladipo stayed, um, Ohio State's had five or six guys, Michigan State just had two guys. So we've had a unique thing is that we've had a little bit of it because we've had great four-year players. Relative to the yeah, competition. Into the yeah. competition. So yeah. our culture, even though Swanigan left after two years, is the opposite of everybody else because we've had the most people drafted in the last 11 years in the Big Ten um, that have stayed four years. So we've had six guys. Um, so it's different. You hear about the one and dones. The draft normally, 80 to 90% of the first 14 picks in the draft are normally freshmen. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody's 20 um, kind of in that cohort right there. So it's, it's different when you can keep people and keep people involved. When you're always losing them, now you've got to start over. And it's, it's very, very hard. So the people that have stayed, um, we had 800 transfers last year, college basketball. There's 350 teams. So, you know, I know we're all pretty good at math. You can figure that out on an average, you know. So we've averaged a little bit over one a year since I've, you know, been here for 13 years. So I'm half of the, you know, I'm about at the 25 percentile. So we're pretty good. So when people say, hey, why did this guy leave? You know, actually at times it's a good thing because um, you can't keep everybody happy. It's just hard. It's, it's really hard to keep everybody happy. So I always, that's my line to them. So since I can't keep all of you happy, I might as well do the right thing. So That's good. That prompted something I wanted to say because we got young people who are thinking about a career. Um, I mean, there are differences in industry you choose and companies you choose. Um, you know, I'm the CEO, I'm 51. I walked off this campus 30 years ago and people say to me, oh, you're really young to be a CEO. But that was 30 years ago. So, um, new people come to the company and they're very eager to get ahead quickly. Um, one thing about our company is I, it's a process. It's gonna take a couple decades to get to senior roles. That's how it is. Um, people who wanna move around quickly and are impatient probably won't do as well uh, with us. If you wanna learn a business and grow in a company, we're gonna invest in you. Uh, that's our philosophy, it's a little bit different. Um, and then 30 years goes by and all of a sudden you're in senior positions that can happen to you, um, but that's, a, that's an expectation piece, speaking about setting right expectations. Uh, when we recruit off campus, some people I think are in a hurry, and we're probably not the right place to work, you're gonna get frustrated. But if you wanna think about, hey, I can achieve my goals through time if I put in the work, the company's gonna invest and develop in you. They, did, they took risks on me, they put me in positions to learn and grow. Um, that's something that we believe in and embrace, and I think it's pretty different about Lilly from other major corporate employers. How do, how do you lead Team Lilly or Team Boilermaker through adversity? Your stock price drops or your patent runs out or your center breaks yeah. its arm. What do you, how do you do that? What do you <laughs> <laughs> it was the elbow. He broke oh, his elbow. elbow. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Um, you know, you're used to, uh, you're used to adversity. I, I always say that after a loss. Um, when our guys, I, after I talk briefly about it, I try not to talk very much after a game as time goes on because uh, you don't really know everything um, until you really you watch the tape because most of us follow the ball in the game. There's so many other things that go on. I've said so many things after a game that I've been wrong about. Um, so I try to keep it as short as I can. Um, there's always two or three games that obviously that's, that doesn't hold true. Um, but I always say, you know, when things don't go your way and how you act, that's class. You know, class is what you show when things don't go your way. So I think you're always in a position of adversity to find out about people and to find out about your team. So I always think that's, you know, you can really grow. You, you know, you get a loss. You don't need a bunch of losses to learn a lesson, but you do need one. Um, 
you know, at, at times. So um, it's just part of it. You, you know it's coming. Um, you know, you can feel it coming. You try to prevent it from happening. And sometimes, it, you know, especially when you get out of your own environment or you're dealing with somebody who's young that's not ready for a position or not ready to play that many minutes and they have to. Um, so but just for us, it's just it's, it's everyday life. The one thing you have to do in, in the preseason um, and in practice, you have to create false adversity because there's not a lot of adversity in practice leading up to your first game. So you have to do some different things to create um, some trouble. Whenever some trouble happens or somebody misses class or something happens or whatever, I always tend to overreact about it on purpose. They, they think I'm crazy, but it's okay. Um, because I just want to see how people are going to react. Like you didn't go to class or you were late or you were late and you lied about being late. Um, so, you know, trying to get them to be as, you know, understand the honesty, you know, just when you make a mistake, raise your hand. You made one mistake, but when you lie or you move from it and, you know, you try to tell a whopper, you know, now you've made two mistakes. Now you've made it worse. So if you can get guys to be on time, if you can get guys to learn some simple lessons, that's what really, like when you deal with talented people, the, the ones that become great are the ones that can do simple things over and over. Like you think in your mind, man, he's great. Man, well, he had to do extraordinary things. No, he's just really, really good and really, really consistent at doing simple things. That's life. Uh, that's the way it is. You get guys that are structured. You get guys that you've ever dealt with that was like have a military background or have you know, discipline at home. You know, when you give order and you say, hey, this is what we're doing, it's easy for them. The other people, it's, it's really hard for them. So you have to be able to you know, create that habit and help them. But also, you know, adversity is your friend. Uh, don't look at adversity like it's that, that bad a thing that you can't keep having it. Um, but, but it is your friend. It will help you and it will help you grow um, if you use it in the right manner. Yeah, on our end, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are a little bit different about our company. It's one of the reasons I love it. One of them is how we behave under adversity. I think many, com many leaders of a company like Lily would worry about that. To be honest, when there's clear and present danger, at all levels of the company I've worked, around the world, and including in some of the darkest hours for the corporate entity, which you know, we, we faced some serious situations not so long ago. Actually, that people in our company, I, th I think because we do something pretty important for the world, it's been going on a long time, people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And that, it's amazing how people rally. They just want to know, how, how do I help? I'm actually more worried about like your preseason is when things are going well, and things are going pretty well yeah. right now, how do we sustain edge? And mm -hmm. I feel like I'm the grumpiest guy in the room right now all the time, because I'm looking for ways to make people a little bit like, well, that's not good enough. Um, and that's, I'm sure it's annoying my staff extensively. But um, having seen ups and downs, you know what it's like the other way, and you don't want to ever be there again. Uh, so I feel like my job is to find ways to keep uh, getting better against ourselves, even when we're at the top. That's a difficult thing to do. I'm not sure in Lily, maybe my Lily colleagues can disagree at the break. Um, that's a, exactly how we're wired. You know, I think when there's a desperate need, people rally like nothing else uh, in our business, complex business, and we need lots of people to do it. I can't possibly know everything. Nobody can. Um, it's more when you're trying to sustain success. How do we keep looking beyond the shores of Indiana? How do we seek to really change the course of the company for a long time. And we have a chance to do that right now. Um, so I, I'm, that's, what I'm, that's what's itching me a little bit. Well, let's, yeah. let's talk a little bit about Lily, and, and uh, I'm sure these students would love to hear how, to, how to, to latch on down the road. But in fact, Lily has hired more people from Purdue than any other university in the world. That's right. Uh, and it's, um, it's got to be more than it's 60 miles away. What, uh, what else is involved in that? Yeah, they may have something to do with it well, in I'm some sure. ways. Uh, we, we, because, uh, honestly, I'm giving you a fee. <laughs> we're the only drug company in Indiana. So people don't come to Indiana to, to find jobs in the drug industry. We bring them to Indiana to be in the drug industry. Um, but the institutions have had a long history, as we described, um, back and forth. The Lilies are very involved with Purdue from the beginning. I remember taking classes in the Lilly Hall of Life Science, which I believe is still called that. Um, and on and on, there's lots of connectivity. You see all the uh, Purdue alumni in our company. 2,000 is the number I know, a little more than 2,000, which I think is three times the next university. Mm. Um, so we are uh, Boilermakers mm. more than anything. Um, 
And we, it's across all technical functions, and that's one of the reasons. It's a great technical university. We're in a technical business. It's a great source for talent. But I also think those values I talked about, you know, humble people who are willing to work hard on tough problems and like working together. I think those are the Purdue people have done well. They stay, um, and, and that's, uh, I think, important. At, at our leadership team, I think I'm the second or third um, CEO to have touched Purdue in some way. There's a number of executive committee members who've uh, graduated through the years from Purdue. People do well uh, from this school, and so that's why we're here on Mass today. We want to find some more boilermakers. What do you, what do you look for? What, what, yeah. You want to be humble and all that. Yeah. You're not going to get that in the resume, though. No, what do you no. look for? Well, it's right. It's competitive. People want to put on their best. But, you know, I, connecting to the mission, why do you want to work in this company? Because the work is complicated. It's hard. And as I said, the 20, maybe, maybe I'm getting old now and I have kids of my own, but, you know, the, the perception of millennials is impatience, right? This is a business where our business takes time. It's not fast uh, paced where you're going to launch a product every six months, and that's really exciting. It, things are hard technically. Biology is the last unknown science. We really don't know what we're doing in biology. We're still figuring it out. Um, and that's how the human body works. So that makes it exciting because breakthroughs are really miracles still. Um, but it takes enormous um, kind of, you have to assault uh, uh, these ideas with numbers because most of them don't work out. And so that kind of discipline and, and understanding that there'll be a lot of failure along the way. Um, those, are, those are attributes, that, that, that attribute matters. I think, you know, also um, the personal growth, open to learning, curious, and as I said, that if you're willing to do that over a long period of time, you can have a fantastic career uh, in leadership or in technical advancement uh, because that's our belief is we want to keep people as long as we can, longer than coach can. Mm -hmm. uh, we want 35-year careers. We want people to grow and develop with us. I guarantee you everything we're hiring for you for uh, in May, you will not be important in five years. Right? You'll have to relearn new technical skills or learn management skills. It's about who you are and your curiosity that matters. What do, you, what do they want to avoid? What's in interviewing with us? In preparing to work at Lilly. Well, I the, think, what are the yeah, don't the be underprepared. Adverse characteristics. Yeah, don't I be underprepared. I think uh, those transferable skills I spoke about are important. So if, you, if you're just an expert in your field, that's good, but probably not going to be good enough. So take the advantage this year if you're a senior, get involved in things, grow yourself in ways that will help you perform in an organization, not just a classroom. Uh, those are things you can do to up your odds. Let's talk about uh, once you've got them, once you've got the players, what do you do as a coach and a, a, as a leader of a business to build leadership within those teams? Uh, each, right. each group is going to have a, a, a leader. How do, you, right. how do you get a person up to that level? Yeah. Well, I think to piggyback off what he said is, you know, kind of the makeup of a, of a person that you want um, is somebody who's hardworking, intelligent, and loyal. Because an intelligent person is going to be able to adapt and change. Um, you, you see in our business sometimes when you have somebody with a high test score and a low GPA, those guys are going to fail more times than not because they have the talent, but they don't have the work ethic. Now you'll see somebody with a low test score and a higher GPA, and they might not have as much resources, but they have the work ethic because they, they, they put in the time. So just, you know, when, whenever you're trying to deal, you know, and, and, and try to figure things out and you have leadership, and you're trying to grow guys, I think sometimes it's kind of like your parents, like you won't listen to your parents, but if somebody else gave the same message, you'll come home and tell your parents, hey, check out, listen to this. Listen to what I heard today. And you'd be like, man, my mom, I've just said your mom's losing her mind. Like I've said that to you a million times, but yet you wouldn't take it. Sometimes the message um, from other people um, is very powerful. First of all, words are powerful. So one of the things that I've really tried to do is never forget how it feels to be a player. Um, and I want people to feel good about themselves. So we do personality testing now. We started about six, seven years ago, which all major companies kind of do. And one of the characteristics in mine, and there's nobody in our support staff, and there's nobody on our team um, that has this characteristic, and it's inner harmony, and it's one of mine. And so when things are wrong, it bothers me. So I just got to fix it. So if something bothers me with Rafael, I got to talk to Rafael. I don't have to talk to him for an hour. But I got to talk to him for a couple of minutes. I got to get it right. So I think those things are so important 
to be able to bring others in to deliver that message. So we've had people come in in drugs and alcohol. Uh, Chris Heron, who's had his own 30 for 30, he was very, very powerful. He's come in a couple times. Um, we've had the Navy SEALs come in. We've had Clark Kellogg come in, who was um, kind of life after basketball. Um, you guys are too young, but Clark Kellogg was a great, great college and professional basketball player. Um, had knee troubles and only played eight, nine years in the NBA. Pacers. Um, for the Pacers, yes. But um, has been a broadcaster, has been a mentor, has been an analyst, just a superhuman being. He's come in to talk to our guys. So I could keep going. I can't get enough people to come in and, and send my message because I become Charlie Brown's teacher. I become your mom or dad. You know, you, that's, this is what you hear. There's times in the year that I, I stay away um, on purpose. I just stay away. They, they, they can't get me every day for 12 months. They just can't. So when, when I have to deliver messages and I have to be consistent, I'm very consistent in my messages. I don't get off it too much. Um, so they know if they're paying attention, um, you know, what I want, how I want it, and how we go about it. We have a personality guy who comes in, does personality profiling. He meets with them every year and explains who I am. This is what, if you're late, you don't go to breakfast, it flies all over me. And you're like, man, what's the big deal? It is a big deal. It's a big deal to me. But I want to find out also what's a big deal to you. So if something's a big deal to you, I'm going to make sure that I try to follow up on it within reason. I mean, you can't say crazy stuff, but um, within reason. So if something's a big deal to you, you know, I want, you know, I want to make sure that you know that it's important. It really isn't that important to me, but now it is because it's important to you. Um, so things of that nature. Um, and then just, you know, I think in leadership, about the only thing I'm really good at is being Matt Painter after a while. Pretty I've, good at that. I've tried to copy everybody. You know, you, you look at people, you, uh, you know, I'm not Gene Cady, but I, I've used his blueprint. I've taken a lot of his principles, but I'm not him. Um, and, and so I think that's the kind of the message I, I send to our guys and try to say, it's okay being you. You know, you are good enough. A lot of times we just don't think we're good enough. When in reality, if you got somebody there that can say, hey, you know, you are good enough, you know, and your best is good enough. And I try to do that from um, I'm probably the only parent in the world that doesn't <laughs> care about grades. I could care less. And you guys are looking at me like, if you give your best, things are going to work out. And if your best and it's biology is not your cup of tea and you get a C, then you get a C. Who cares? I'm yet to do an algebra equation <laughs> as a coach. I'm yet, I'm yet to do one. I understand the importance of it. I understand the importance of doing things that you don't want to do because that's, that's life, man. If you, if you learn to do things that you don't want to do, you get to do the things that you do want to do. And so, that's, and so you, you have to have some things in front of you um, that are tough for you, that you don't like, that you can push through, and then now that really allows you to do that. But I, I'm just big on that. I'm, I'm big on putting your best, you know, put your best foot in front of you, trying your best, having a good attitude, and things will take care of themselves. Yeah, for us, you know, we, we hire people for jobs, but more for career. So learning and development is key. Uh, but the first thing we have to do is, is make sure you know how to do the job you're in. Uh, that's our responsibility. That's your responsibility. But it's also kind of our promise to customers and to people who rely on our medicine. So that's the basics. Um, that has to, you have to be good at that. <laughs> that's the first thing. And then, you know, it sort of branches into two parts. I, I think... Um, we do have a number of programs that um, are about teaching people to do things beyond their job so they're ready for the next thing. Um, but a fair amount of development, in my personal experience, doesn't happen in those programs. It doesn't happen by you know, reading articles. It's, it happens by putting yourself in situations where you're not very comfortable. Because you, I think survival inst instincts take over. and You have to change yourself to be successful. That's what growth looks like. So um, stretching yourself beyond the scope of doing your job well is important for growth and development. And then outside of the, outside of the direct corners of the job, people have to be curious and seek it out. And I think that sort of self-development plan is an important part of, of succeeding as well. The good news in our company, I think, is a lot of people come and they want all those things. Um, and that allows us to have this sort of long career path and uh, growth and development within the company. All right, your chance. Any questions for Coach Painter? Well, maybe one question. Uh, Redfield Davis has worked for you for a while, now he works for me. <laughs> Anything I need to know about this guy? Uh, uh, there you go. Well, he, well, he you know, he's, 
like every one of your guys, you know, your dreams to play in the NBA. You know, it's just, and I always talk about having two dreams. We have a dream through basketball, we have a dream through education. Mm -hmm. And then I always say fools have one dream. Mm -hmm. And in our world, fools have one dream. Because yeah. um, you're an injury away from things. You know, you're in the less than 1%, even after you make, you know, Division One basketball. So, um, you know, Rayfell was a guy that, we've been to 10 out of 12 NCAA tournaments. And Rayfell was a guy that in his first two years did not go. Mm -hmm. And kind of in the face of adversity, you know, he was the guy that handled things behind the scenes for us um, and got us back into the NCAA tournament. So we didn't, um, we won the Big Ten the year after he left, and we gave him a Big Ten ring for all that he did to mm -hmm. help us get to that awesome. point. So, um, and Foot you friendly. just, you know, when, when you get to those decisions, so many guys pride. I always say your pride can't get in the way of your paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your, your pride gets in the way as a player. You know, not as a person, but it, we all have that ego. We all have that. And then when he was trying to play right away overseas, he was really working hard to get to that point. And then this opportunity came up. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you can, go to, you can go to Germany for three or four years, but you've got Eli Lilly the rest of your life. Yeah. And so well, a lot you. of times that doesn't resonate with someone <laughs> who at a young age, it's hard to be in, it's hard to really be intelligent as a young person because you just haven't lived enough. It just is, I don't care what your board scores are, yeah. you just haven't lived long enough. Um, <laughs> you know, you haven't made enough mistakes, but Rafael was, um, he, he was groomed uh, through structure. His, his dad's got a military background and stuff. At times he didn't have a choice, so. Um, he, he gets that part of it and he gets the big picture, so. Well, I called this uh, sales director on the way up here. See how he's doing. So, he, rookie of the year last year, his first year on his team. That's good news. Made his go. numbers. A little bit behind right now, I heard. But, uh, <laughs> but he's working on it. Yeah. But he's yeah. competitive. I know that. So we're yeah. lucky to have you, yeah. Rayfield. And, yeah. uh, that's right. Right. Yeah. We always see you have to beat your last year. Yeah. Right? So the that, that's coaching. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. only you know, your guide as a coach is your best season. That's how fans look at it. Yeah. That's how people look at it. It's not realistic, but that's that's just the way it is. And so when you get into sales, it's the same way. It's like, you know, now you have your best year of sales, which is obviously his first year. And so now that's... Yeah, you got to beat it. Yeah, and if you beat it, then that's what, then it changes. New baseline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah, that's good. We've got about 10 minutes left. You've got the coach and they have got the CEO up here. Anybody in the audience have a question for any of them? Really? Should There's one it? back there. Let's hear it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, well, the first question is, we, we kind of have a well-oiled machine um, when you're allowed to stay. So there's 14 teams in the Big Ten. There's only one coach that has been there longer um, than I have. It's Tom Izzo at Michigan State. But um, Elliot Bloom's our director of basketball operations. And, uh, you know, he's, he's worked at Duke. He's worked at Kansas. He's worked for Coach Katie. Um, you know, he's been with me, and he really runs our show. And so him and I really collaborate on what's the best thing, you know, for our players, what's the best thing for our program. And we're constantly trying to learn um, to improve our product and to understand things. So from a marketing, promotions, camp, academics, we, you know, and so we have a very good academic system um, at our place. There's no loopholes. Um, to it so but it starts with discipline it starts with doing what you're supposed to be doing so a lot of the things that you're talking about like we're constantly picking at other people I went to a clinic last week for two days in Gainesville Florida not to speak but to learn so you're constantly learning and so when you stop learning you're in trouble and so I think that's why we've been able to have a lot of success but I also you know he's very intelligent um, you know he, he could work Eli Lilly, he could work in Fortune 5 company. He, he's very, very sharp. And so, but I've, he, I've gotten him to stay. So anytime I have extra money, camp money, whatever, I try to just give him as much money as I can to stay. But he, he's, he's very valuable for our, uh, um, you know, for our program. In terms of Romeo Langford, Romeo Langford's a very talented player. 
very talented player. I had a guy that was in, well, I wouldn't call it my class, I'd call it his class, that was from the state of Kentucky named Allen Houston, um, who was a really good pro, and um, uh, who, who ended up, his dad had got the head coaching job at Tennessee, this was 30 years ago. Um, he kind of reminds me of him, um, very, very effortless in terms of how he can shoot the ball and release the basketball um, there. And so sometimes some of the pressure that's like put on, I played with Glenn Robinson, so I, I felt it firsthand. You know, you have so much coming at you. Uh, but he's a, he's a good kid. He's a really good kid. And he's a good, he's a really good player. So but that's what it's about. That's what's coming to the Big Ten. You know, that's what you want. You know, you want to go against those type of guys. You want to compete against those guys. I had a chance to go up against the Fab Five, um, Jimmy Jackson's Ohio State teams, Calvert Chaney's team, Steve Smith at Michigan State. I mean, that, uh, that was unbelievably fun, but that's the challenge that you want. You want to play, um, you know, you want, you, want, you want to play against the best. But no, I'm, I'm a big fan of his. He, he's a good player. I'm not a, I don't try to, I know it might sound crazy, but I don't try to demonize our opponents. I'm not that guy. Um, I got respect for him. Now we're going to, you know, we're going to compete. We're going to play hard, but, um, but yeah, we're looking forward to it. Now, you know, back in those days, we had a three-peat, too. So <laughs> Purdue had a lot to offer as well as those guys. Yeah. So. Right. I mean, for, for me, you know, how I manage has probably changed through the years, to be honest. One reason is because um, senior people are pretty good, right? So, but the, the, some are newer, and so they need a little more um, direction, a little more assistance. Um, but I, kind of a philosophy I have in leading is, Everybody can do more. Everybody can be more. But if you push them too far, then people, they're not going to buy into that, and it's, it's too uncomfortable. At the same time, if you don't push at all, then there's no respect, and it's, you're going you're to lose your edge. So I try to find that sweet spot with each of my direct reports where I give them something to think about that they need to be improving, and so you're always growing. Um, not too much, not too little. Uh, that's sort of the idea. And then in terms of, you know, style, I mean, as a group, I, I don't believe in public, you know, prosecutions. You know, we, we, I do that privately, and sometimes it's heated. But um, as a group, that's not, that's not what I do. More supportive. Right. Question back here. Um, I don't know if it's something they say. I think the old adage in recruiting is judge people on what they do and not what they say. But it's just, you just kind of know it. Um, I dig into the external piece of it, which is the most outside of the production, the physical production, um, after you've checked off everything. The external piece is the biggest piece for me in terms of do they have any issues? And the people they bring with them, you know, or either positive or negative, there's no in between. Um, so like, you know, can, what can you deal with? What can you, you know, kind of get to um, at that point? But man, it's just sometimes it's, um, you know, you have a little bit of a feel about somebody, but you just have to do your work. Like they're, they're not gonna give you the answer. It's like seeing a resume and someone has references. I could care less what those people think. You know, I, want, I gotta get my own answer. You know, me asking somebody's mom, if they're a good kid, I mean, are you, are you, I mean, you know, heck yeah, it's my baby, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's a good kid. You know, the high school coach, hey, he's a good kid. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, everyone has a different definition. Everybody has a different, so you, you have to figure things out on your own. That's, that's the best way. That's the one thing about being somewhere for a long time and being from a certain place. It helps you because you build that trust through the years. You know, that you're going to have disagreements, but you build trust. Your honesty builds trust, and I think that's that's really helped us. Um, but it's 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 nothing they really say. It's trying to get a feel, and I just, I I'm more into evaluating than I am recruiting. If that makes any sense, you know, I'll, I'll start recruiting once I get the evaluation kind of figured out. Our business is you got to kind of get out there a lot. You got to come early and often. You got to throw your line in the water a lot, and so now the media will pick up, they follow us in what we do, and they'll say, you should get this guy, you should get that guy. I want to make sure we get Purdue's guy, not Matt Painter's guy. You know, get Purdue's guy. Get a guy that, you know, education's important. Get a guy that understands, 
you know, what they're getting into. So. Yeah, for us, you know, the, um, these days, the people I'm interviewing, they don't get there if they're not good already. So it's more about the, how they think. Um, and it's, it's almost the opposite. So I like competitive people who want to win for the organization, not themselves. Um, they want to be a part of something, not, not just be number one in a small pool. Um, and I like people who admit mistakes. Um, I like what you said, you know, just keep looking for mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, you know, that's when you really have to reflect and change who you are. When, when you're successful, it's kind of easy, right? Um, and in an interview setting, that's difficult to sort of say, oh, this is the biggest mistake I made and what I learned. Um, and you know, if those are real examples, I respect that. And if they really did learn and apply it, I respect it even more. So those are some of the intangible things that make the biggest difference. Time for one more. Anybody? Right here. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> the value might go down a little bit. Awesome. <laughs> so, awesome. Um, you know, pressure's, you know, I think pressure's something for a team that I try to talk about is something you feel when you're not prepared. You know, do your work, get out in front of your problems, be prepared. You know, this is what we do. You know, this is what we do. And so, from a basketball standpoint, um, as a coach, you're, you're a replacement. Okay. If they came in, what I mean by that is, and he's, and he's a replacement. They're, they're going to have another CEO at Eli Lilly after him. Yep. They're going to have another head coach after me. Like, embrace that, and, that, and that's cool. Like, you know, like, if they came in and said, hey, you know what, we're going to fire you. We're going to go in the other direction. Hey, man, appreciate it. I was the head coach at Purdue 13 years longer than I thought I was going to be. You know? <laughs> What's the, you know, who am I? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that big a deal. And so... I'm just kind of a spoke in the wheel as a coach. I think it's a player's game. It's my opinion. I don't want to be on a media guide. I don't want to be on a billboard. I love my job and I hate the attention. Um, I'm okay here, but it's like, I, it's, it's not something I relish. I just, I didn't get into coaching to make money. I got into coaching because I love people and I love basketball. I'm really good in basketball trivia, but if you get outside of that, I'm not good in any other trivia. <laughs> so, um, but I, I kind of go with that ideal of that in terms of pressure. Just it, it, I, I, even though you feel it some as a coach, if you show it, they're going to feel it. If you don't show it and just kind of stay in the moment and just coach the game and, and be there with them. And you have a lot of experience. It's been my 26th year in coaching, and I played before that. Um, so, but, but, but that's the thing. And I, I, I told her guys last week. If you, don't, if you do something that you're not supposed to do and you put me in a position, you know, you're going to probably have to move because this is about Purdue and it's not about you. But if I do something or I don't, you know, win or the administration just thinks they want to make a change, you know, they will still play this season. They're still going to play it without you and they're still going to play it without me. So we're very, very fortunate to be at Purdue. Don't think Purdue's fortunate to have you. So I try to really sell that as much as I can because these guys have gotten recruited. These guys have gotten ranked since they're 13, 14, 15 years old. So I try to get the entitlement out of them, if it's in them. Try not to recruit guys that way, but it kind of comes a little bit. So um, if you can do that and you can, you can reach them in that area, because um, the world doesn't care if you have a turnaround jump shot. It just doesn't. You know, it'd be cool. You might see someone at a bar in their 20s say, I remember you at that shot against Michigan. In reality, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It's a game of basketball. Who cares? But these guys get lifted up. You know, I think it's more of what you kind of do for humanity. You know, take, take this position or whatever and help other people. Because there's no such thing as individual success. It's a myth. It does not happen. Individuals do not become successful on their own. It's never happened ever in the course of mankind. So a lot of times they will feel that way as a 17, 18 year old. They will feel that. And there's nothing wrong, it's a very natural feeling. You gotta get them off that. You gotta get them to understand of the people that helped them and how things were shaped and how they were fortunate. You know, they're, they're fortunate. They're very opportunistic. You know, things have happened in their life outside of people that are just physically dominant. Isaac Haas is, you know, he's physically dominant. He's 7'2", 300 or size 22 shoes, you know, the Lord touched him on the head. You know what I mean? And so, like, he's, he's the outlier. So what the, the common Joes that are on your team is like, hey, man, 
You know, be thankful, be appreciative, you know, you know, do little things to help other people out. So Coach Ricks. Great attitude. Yeah, I love that. Well, I mean, not too dissimilar. I, I try not to take myself very seriously. I think that's <laughs> that's one piece of it. And having kids at home help me with that, especially a teenage girl. Yeah. So she doesn't take me very seriously either and <laughs> sort of helping me. <laughs> um, and I do try to live simply and not, I haven't really changed much about how we live uh, in this job. Um, pressure, I think, does come from when you feel disappointed in yourself or a sense that you might be disappointed. So a lot of this is about an expectation game and then being prepared to deliver on your own expectations. Um, and then you just have to be, uh, I think, uh, as Matt said, you know, know your place, right? If you, if you think you're all that, you're going to disappoint yourself a lot. Um, rather, just I want to learn. That was a mistake. Let's move on. And know that someday you're not going to be there. And hopefully you did your part to keep the organization on a path toward uh, whatever the ultimate goal is. In our case, the best in our sector at making medicines that cure disease. That's what we're here to do. And if we do that better than when I started, I'll be pretty happy. And that may be, you know, the board could fire me tomorrow. But if we're doing it better, then I'll, I'll feel okay with that. I told you when we started, these guys are going to sound a lot more alike than you might think. And I, I think they're, they're almost the identical people. Welcome. We appreciate this so very much. Uh, I hope you found a lot of your next hires all through and had a very successful I hope so, too. Day Thank you for hosting us. I think this has been special. Thanks very much, Coach. Thank you. And Dave Ricks. Boiler up. Boiler up.